Good morning. Oh, sorry. good afternoon, everybody. Um, I guess my body's still all morning. How's everybody doing today? Having a good good time so far? Anybody in the last session, Chris O'Brien's ALM session on build stuff? Yeah, hate following that because that was really impressive, and now I feel like I'm looking at my deck like, huh, that was really cool. <laughs> Metadata, not nearly as cool. Uh, so what we're going to talk about in this session is um, I struggle coming up with a name for this, but um, what I find is that a lot of people uh, with this new thing that we have in SharePoint 2010, uh, metadata, very structured metadata, and the facilities to be able to implement it, I find a lot of people have questions about how do I play with this stuff programmatically. Um, it's great using it out of the box, and users love it. It's love it to go through and to customize it. So how do I go through and deal with this from a more API stance? And so that's what I'm going to go through today. Um, so my what I'm going to cover here is first, talk really briefly about the managed metadata service application. Um, very briefly, because I figure most people are aware of what this is by now, and we're diving into the API side of it, but then I don't think this is brand new to you. Uh, talk about some of the challenges and um, solutions for uh, creating and importing taxonomies, how we can create managed metadata columns, not just um, through the browser, uh, but more importantly, I'm going to focus on how you can do it in a more repeatable fashion. Uh, we can't do it declaratively in a reliable way, so we do it programmatically, and I'll show you how to go about doing that. Um, I'm assuming probably a lot of people have already done that. Um, we're going to spend more time on kind of reading and writing to the, the taxonomy store. Programming with the taxonomy field, and then finally overcoming some limitations that Link has, uh, Link to SharePoint, and how we can go through and extend the models that SharePoint's going to generate for us uh, into for Link. So just real briefly, just a uh, little about who who is this person standing on stage. My name is Andrew Connell. I'm an MVP for SharePoint Server. A couple ways you can get in touch with me if you have any questions that we don't um, get to at the end of the session here, um, or if you don't, track me down sometime in the next few days. Um, please feel free to fire them at me uh, on Twitter. I promise I'll answer them. Um, then just a couple of other information about me, and then uh, we do SharePoint training, but I'm not going to dwell on a sales pitch or anything. We're going to jump right into the content here. So. Managed metadata in SharePoint, what is this? Well, we have these phrases called term, term set, term scopes. What is all this stuff? Um, really helps to understand this uh, before you dive into the API because the API is going to be really strongly uh, tied to these different terms. So what is a term? A term is really just a word or a phrase that we're going to use in a tagging scenario, all right, or to be able to quantify or qualify certain kinds of content here. We can use them a couple different ways, either as a managed terms or as keywords. So Think of it more as taxonomies versus folksonomies. Taxonomy being a very structured hierarchy of phrases and such. Um, that's your term set. Those are going to be your terms. Um, that's your taxonomy. A folksonomy is more like keywords, which is basically, um, well, most of us have used Facebook or used uh, uh, Twitter, where we can just throw a hashtag or start tagging pictures with people's uh, names and such. There's no organization to it. There's no hierarchy. It's just to kind of anybody have at it, just start throwing phrases at stuff. All right. SharePoint supports both of those. Um, a collection of terms, we call that a term set. So maybe for, say, um, different kinds of courses that are, or uh, sessions that are going on this week, maybe you have them broken down by um, the audience type. And then from there, inside of that, we're going to have uh, the different sessions. We also have two different kinds of scoping around terms. You have a global and a local. So what a global term is going to be, or a global term set is going to be, is one that I'm going to define inside of my service application that anybody that's tied to that service application, any site collection that's tied to it, is going to be able to leverage the terms inside of that term set. A local term set is one that, hey, look, I want to use terms, but I don't have the access to the managed metadata service app. And more importantly, they really only apply to my specific site collection. So what I can do is have terms that are tied just to my site collection by creating a local term set that I can manage from the site collections site settings page. So two different scopings here. For, this, for this, the topic of this talk to just kind of uh, focus on a little more of a narrow kind of um, solution here, I'm only going to focus on managed terms. I'm only going to focus on global terms. But it all really applies to the, the unmanaged terms, the keywords, and then also uh, local term sets. It's just you have to get references to different things. All right. Uh, we've got the Managed Metadata Service app. Anybody never seen this? So one or two people here. Basically what Microsoft did is they built this application 
It's the visual or the UI piece of the application that's going to point to um, our managed metadata service backend or store to let us go through and manage the terms. Um, I'm personally not that big of a fan of this. I think this is a really, it's like they built this great metadata infrastructure and then at the last minute said we need a UI for this. And they kind of threw it in there. And when you start to work with really big taxonomies, you'll find what I, you'll see what I mean when it's just like this is really not cutting the mustard. This is not giving me the, the real kind of um, powerful editing experience that I need. Um, specifically, this little area over here on the left hand side that I'm pointing to, um, you get a little tree of working with your terms. Each one of these little term sets that you see those little nodes right there, uh, each one of those can hold up to 30,000 terms. Uh, the best part is, is that it's all going to scroll between 30,000 terms in a hierarchy in that little space right there. Not really effective, right? So, um, but it's still, it still, it works. We can still, we can still use it or you can go through and build your own uh, front end to it. This is going to give us the ability to really do everything that we need to do with our terms. Being able to create terms, being able to create um, synonyms so that I can say something like uh, England or I can say if somebody tags it with England or tags it with UK, we see that as the exact same thing, right? Or we see it as, which I might have just said something now that somebody from that's more, that's in England is saying, no, 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 that is not at all the case. I did that once in Los Angeles. I was like, look, Los Angeles, San Bernardino, they're all the same. And somebody from San Bernardino was like, we do not live in Los Angeles. Like, I'm sorry. If anybody lives in Los Angeles, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but it gives us some other things that we can do with it as well. All right. One of the things that it's going to allow us to do is also import terms. And you can't really see it all that well on the slide there, but there's a little spot there where there's a link and it kind of lets you pop open a CSV file and say, look, here's the sample CSV format you can use to import terms. But it's really lacking and you're going to find that, hey, that was nice, but it, you know, we got our import, that kind of a little box check feature, but in the real world, it's not really useful at all. And I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, so. I'm going to skip this first demo here. This is really the rudimentary stuff of working with this. I'd rather kind of dive right in and make sure I have enough time to talk about the link stuff at the end and then also to um, uh, make sure that we uh, uh, make sure I have some time for some questions. So if you haven't worked with metadata, metadata please don't worry. You're, we're gonna, you'll pick that up as we go along. It's nothing to sneeze at, though. It's pretty important. All right, so creating and importing taxonomies. So creating them, pretty simple. You can do it through the UI. but it's when you have a big taxonomy, that's a pretty big task. Might be nice to go through and to have a, maybe an XML file or a special Excel file that we're going to use to go through and to create and define our taxonomies. Um, I've worked with some customers. I worked with a customer in um, a big law firm in New York City, and they, they had this massive system that they used to go through and do all of their um, uh, tagging and all these different terms that they define in their own, uh, in their own business. It's a special kind of uh, localized or uh, special vertical application for legal-based uh, metadata. And they really liked SharePoint's metadata um, capabilities, but there's really no way for SharePoint metadata to kind of point to a different backing store and say that all my terms are over there. They have to live inside of this service app. So we didn't want to, we wanted to go through and feed in terms from this existing system they had of, a, I think it was something like a quarter million terms, and we wanted to feed that into SharePoint. We're not going to hire a bunch of people to go through and to type those in. So we wanted to find a way to make it a more programmatic or more automated process. Um, you're going to find that the import process that we get out of the box from, from Microsoft, I've already mentioned that it was a bit lacking. Uh, first of all, you have to use their format, which isn't really all that bad. Um, it just, you'll find that it just kind of gets a little messy working with their structures because you have to keep repeating um, the top level every time you add a second level. So, if I was going to say, like, um, states in the United States, I'd have one term, uh, say, in one column, say United States. Then it would say Florida. The next row, I would say United States, Georgia, United States, Alabama, United States, New York, and just start listing them that way. But United States has to be listed for all of them so it knows where it goes in the hierarchy. And if I added deeper levels down, I'd have to duplicate Florida a couple times, all that stuff. It's a little messy. The other big challenge that we have is that the out-of-the-box import does not support synonyms, so being able to define other terms that are really going to be seen as the same thing. It's not going to also be able to allow us to do anything multilingual. All of this stuff is something you're going to want to look to a custom solution for. It seems a little tricky at first, but it's actually really easy, and there's only four, three or four little things you have to do before you start going through and working with and importing a taxonomy programmatically. It's pretty straightforward, okay? 
What you're going to end up need, wanting to do here is you're going to use this new API or this API that Microsoft provides called the, it's in the Microsoft.SharePoint.Taxonomy DLL. It's a very robust API for working with metadata. Um, the nice thing about this, even as a V1, the, the API is very flushed out. There's not many things that are missing from it, I would think. Um, there's a couple process things that would be nice to have that we don't have. Um, but still, it's a pretty good API. Um, and then the user story is very good. Things where this is kind of missing, I think, are uh, I would look at things such as um, uh, like a web services based implementation of the metadata. It's hard to get to if you're not on the box, uh, like from like a Silverlight application or something like that. Um, and then also some more search capabilities. I'd like to find exactly how many items have been tagged with this term. It, you don't really get that out of the box. You've got to go look to search for that stuff. So how are we going to go about doing this? How are we going to import our own taxonomy? There's a couple steps you have to do I mentioned earlier, right? So first of all, very robust, but what do you have to do? There's only two things you have to do ahead of time. You first have to get a reference to a taxonomy session. You can think of that as just saying, give me a context that I want to connect to. Now, what this is is that I have to first go through, I have to get a reference to that service app. How do you get to service applications in SharePoint? You do it by going through a site collection because the site collection lives in a web application or is surfaced in a web application. That web application is associated with a specific managed metadata service or multiple ones. So what I'm going to do is say create a new taxonomy session that's going to be, that I'm going to use the site collection to get access to that. We'll see the code for that in a minute. Once I've gotten a taxonomy session, that's not connecting me to a specific managed metadata service application instance, or is what we call it a term store, right? It's not referencing that yet, because I could have my web app could be connected to multiple managed metadata um, service apps. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go through and say, let's connect it to a specific one, all right? Once I do that, I then have access to go through and to create new term sets or create groups put um, term sets in that group and then start creating terms inside of that uh, term set with hierarchies and all this other stuff here. So a couple of the objects you're going to work with inside of the object model. The taxonomy session gives us the context. The term store is a specific instance that you would see in that managed metadata, or sorry, managed service applications uh, page in central administration. You could also have the group kind of have a bunch of like term sets, maybe their products, maybe their lines of business, something like that term set, and then term is the actual term here. Um, when you look at a label, what it is, the way it's set up in the API is that a term is just an object. It doesn't have a name or anything associated with it. What happens is, is that you have a bunch of labels that are hanging off of that one term object, and one of them has been given a little flag that says, I'm the default label. So I'm the one that's going to show up. So when you think about it and you're doing this in the UI, the first time you create a term, you're creating a term object, you're setting a label to it, and you're saying that label is the default label. When you go to add additional ones, it's adding more labels, it's just not flagging them as the default. Okay, make sense? All right, so let's see how we can go through and programmatically import one of these guys. So what I have here is I've gone through and I've created my own little proprietary taxonomy here, a little XML file. And what this is, is it's going gonna, it's gonna to use the geography of the United States to go through and to show a bunch of stuff. All right? So what I have is I'm going to have a taxonomy that I'm going to define as called USA Geography. And then I want to have different regions, things like Southeast, Northwest, Southwest, all that kind of stuff. We're just going to stick with Southeast just for, the, for simplicity. Then I want to go through and say, well, what are the children to this Southeast term? You can see that I even went through and, and gave it a label. So the term name is Southeast, but then I said, well, let's add in an alias to SE. So a little bit of debate here when I was working with this one, with this um, law firm, we were like, well, do we go through and give the term a name or do we just say, uh, and then say have a bunch of labels or do we have a bunch of labels and say which one's the default? So we wanted to stick more with like what the UI looks like instead of what the API looked like. So this is just the way we did this schema. We then go through and define a bunch of child terms, and you can see I'm just kind of repeating the hierarchy as I go down, all right? There's a city called Jacksonville, that's where I'm from. You see a label, there's Jacks, and then different neighborhoods and zip codes or postal codes that we have inside of that area, all right? But you can see here another thing that I can do is I can also define the culture. So here's a way for us to not only solve two of the challenges that we have with the out-of-the-box import. First, I can't do multilingual. Second, I can't define synonyms. So I'm able to define both of these this way. 
So that's the taxonomy. How do I go about importing it? What this is, is this is just a standard little console application that's referencing the Microsoft that SharePoint assembly and the taxonomy assembly as well. Wish there was a way they'd give us to bump the, the, just the font up of all these guys, but I'll just leave it as it is. So now let's look at the code for this. The code for this is actually um, it's pretty straightforward um, once you get past all of the navigating the XML bit. So this is a, I've got a recursive function in here, but what you're going to see is a lot of link to XML stuff. I'm going to try and exclude a lot of that and just focus just on the part where we're doing the importing. So you can see there on line 30, oh, sorry, first, we have to prime manage metadata service app. So what is that doing? So what this, this whole block right here is doing is that I'm first on line 15, I'm getting a reference to a taxonomy session. So I'm pointing to a specific site collection and getting a reference to the site collection. And in this case here, I know that I only have one set up. So I'm just saying grab the first term store inside of um, this taxonomy session uh, for this one site collection. If you had multiple, you could pass in either an ordinal value, you could enumerate through them and get a specific ID, or you can even pass it in a string by name. Okay, so a couple different options there, um, as you can see from line 17. All right, I'm then going to go through and create a location, and then I'm going to create a group. And then what the lines 19 and 23 are, um, it's a little hard to read that stuff. I'm com kind of compressing uh, turning your expression down that basically just says, hey, do you find a group name locations? No? Okay, go create the group name location and then give me that reference. Otherwise, if you already have that, then just give me that reference. Okay? So, all this first part, everybody got that. The next thing I'm going to do is once I've, I've created these things, they're not saved just like everything else in SharePoint. They're not saved until I say, go save all my changes. And of course, we love how the fact that it seems like everybody on the SharePoint product team for between the different disciplines, they've all talked to each other and they've all agreed that the way that they're going to update stuff is by calling the update method, except in this case, we're going to call commit all. <laughs> you love that. The consistency is fantastic. It's not a risk. It actually isn't that big of a team either. That's what's so funny about it. Anyway, I think they do some of that stuff intentionally just to give us little Easter eggs and sessions. To, because this is, let's face it, this is some pretty dry stuff, right? Um, okay, so the next thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to go through and load in the XML file, and I'm going to start to go through and kind of create this little iteration to where I'm going to go and recursively call this one method here called process taxonomy right here, and it's going to go through and build up the taxonomy. So what that's going to do, process taxonomy, is going to look at the first node inside that XML file, and he's going to start going through and grabbing all the information out. I keep losing my mouse. So he's going to find the attribute name in there. He's going to come in, pull out all of the, um, the terms for that name, and start writing them into process terms. So here's the term that we've just created. So we created our very first, we're going, to, we're going to have one term that we're going to uh, start with. And what I'm doing with this, you can see I'm using the term set item object here. Term set item has two objects that inherit from it, term set and term. So a term set, you can think of it as just one term with a ton of ch children underneath it. Each term can also have a ton of children. So they're both based on the same object. So to kind of make things easier, we're using the term set item here. And all I'm going to do is now that I have the reference to everything, is I'm simply going to call go to this term set item, which could be at the top level of the entire term set or somewhere else in there. And I'm going to say call the method called create a brand new term passing in a few things like what's the name of the term, what's the culture I want it to be, right? And then once I've done that, I'm going to go see do we have any labels. And if we do have any labels for this guy, any other aliases or synonyms for this one term, I'm going to pull all those out as well and start adding those to, the terms, to that one term as well as additional labels, okay? Next thing I do here is just come down a little bit farther and I just say, do we have any child terms inside of this term we just created? If so, recursively call this function. We just keep running and running and running. All right? So pretty straightforward. We'll come out of here. I'll go through and hit F5 or the little play button. We'll see a little console app pop up, and it should tear through and give me a bunch of debugging information just to show me all the different terms that it's going to create. So while it's doing this, let's fire up central administration. Let's go see the term set that it's, that it's generated. So we can see in the background, I just went through and created them. Come over here to Central Admin, Manage Service Applications, and I'll go to the Manage, service, manage Metadata Service, and what we'll see here
We have our United States Geography Taxonomy. A little bit easier to see. And I lost my scroll bar. Fantastic. That didn't help. Southeast, we have Florida. If I click on Florida, you can see that I have two synonyms that I've set up over here. All right? So really easy to go through and programmatically import and create your own taxonomy and have it managed. All right? So, sorry? Can I do it sandbox? No, I can't do this. I cannot go through and create the term sandbox, in, in the sandbox, no. Um, you, I guess you could argue, I could you almost make an argument of why would you want to end up doing that. What I find most people doing with this is creating some sort of a web service, either doing a one-time console app to go through and import everything, or creating a web service and having uh, terms fed in from some other system. So that's the big thing I see people end up doing with it. What I really want is an OData service for the metadata, but we don't have that. Okay, so that's the first part of importing. Let's talk now, let's switch back to the slides for a few minutes, and let's talk about creating managed metadata columns. So we have a couple different ways of creating managed metadata columns inside of lists and content types and such. You can do it through the browser, just like every other list, or every other way of creating a column. You can do it declaratively, you can do it programmatically. Ah, but declaratively doesn't really work. It doesn't really work. The trick with this is that when you go to create these things, you have to know some stuff when you create the actual column. You have to tell it, where's the managed metadata service application? What's the term store? What term set am I going to be connecting to? And then some other parameters around it as well when you go to create this. Generally speaking, you don't know the ID of these things when you're going to create them and when you're trying to do this stuff declaratively. And so you have to read this stuff either from some settings file or something like that. At least that's been my experience. So the way that I prefer to go through and do this, if I'm going to be doing something repeatable, which we all want to be able to do, is I'm going to do this stuff declaratively. All right? Now, to do this stuff declaratively, oh, sorry, not declaratively. I'm going to do this stuff programmatically. So in the next demo I'm going to do, I'm going to show you a little sample of where we go through and do that in a feature receiver, and then how we can rip that right back out. It's almost the exact same thing. We have to first go through and get that same information that I had in the last demo where we're priming the service application. All right? Let's talk about programming with the managed max, the, the, well, with that, <laughs> the taxonomy field. Ha. Now, there's two things that we want to be able to do with these terms. We want to find them. We want to be able to find them somewhere in our taxonomy. And then I want to be able to write them somewhere. We just saw how to, read, how to write to our taxonomy um, when we did the import. But when I'm working inside of a list or document library, how do I take one of these terms and apply it to a list item? It's a little weird. Let's first talk about the read first. What I'm going to do is I'm first going to go get a reference to the term set. So I've got to go do the same thing I did before. I've got to get a reference to the session. I've got to get a reference to the term store and then get into the locations and then, or the groups and then get into the, um, the term set that I'm in question. So I have to have a way to go through and to select that stuff. I then am going to have access to a method that's got a ton of overloads on it called get terms. I'm going to be able to do different things. Say, give me all the terms. That's not going to be very helpful. I can say, give me all the terms where I'm finding a term that has this kind of a label. And what it does is it looks across the entire term set, flattening down the hierarchy and saying, let me find, give me all the terms that match this criteria. I can filter by culture. I can figure by, uh, filter, filter um, uh, and say I only want ones that are available for tagging. Because one of the things we can do is we can take different terms in our, in our taxonomy, and I can say, I do not want this available um, inside of a tagging scenario. So for example, if I was going to go through and have, um, in the sample I had a second ago that we imported, let's say that I want people to be able to tag it based on locations or something. I don't want people to say, I live in the southeast. I want you to say, you live in a specific city or a specific neighborhood. So I'm going to go to the terms that say southeast and say Florida. And I'm going to mark those as not available for tagging. We're going to simply use them to make it easier to find these different neighborhoods that are listed, instead of giving them a giant list of neighborhoods all across the country. OK? So I can turn that stuff off. Um, I can also say, how many terms should I get back? So should SharePoint go through and say, you're looking for the, a term with a phrase of, uh, I don't know, um, township in it, something like that? I have 10,000 terms that match that. I'm like, well, yeah, you know, that's not going to be very beneficial to me. Why don't I just say, 
at max, give me 10. And if I get 10 that come back, well, then I might just in my UI say dot, dot, dot. There's a lot more, right? So I have a way to go through and to figure that stuff out. So that's how I'm going to get this, these terms. It's going to give me a, a collection of terms, a term set collection, which is just an innumerable collection that I can walk through and see all these different terms. I'm then going to walk through that collection, find the ones that I want, and I want to write them to a list item. How do you do that? Now, to write them to a list item, we're used to, fill, to setting fields or setting values on list items um, by first going to the list, getting a reference to the list, getting a reference to the list item, and then finding the specific column in that list item and then setting the value on that column, right? That's how we're used to doing it. This is a little weird. It doesn't work like that. What you're first going to do is say, get a reference to the list. So before, we've already got the terms that we want to write to the item. I'm going to get a reference to the list. I'm going to get a reference to the list item. And then I'm also going to get a reference to the actual column. All right? The column, not on the list item, but the column on the list itself. All right, so not a specific cell, I guess you could think of if you think of the, the list as like a table. Not a specific cell, but I want the entire column. So I see the record and the column I'm looking for. I'm then going to call this method on the actual column called set field value. And I'm going to pass in the record that I want to update with all the things I want to stick inside that cell. Right? It's a little weird. It's a little bit strange compared to how we're used to going through and writing uh, elements, items to a, a field, but that's how it works. All right, I'm just the messenger, don't shoot me. All right, so let's see how we go about doing this. So what I have in this next demo here, um, let's see, pop him up. I think it might be a little more helpful. Let me, let me go through and let me build and deploy this. I'm going to come and then we'll come back and... Um, and we'll look at that, what it does, and then we'll come back and actually look at the code so you have a little bit of context. So uh, I'm going to go through and, write and deploy this guy. And while he's doing this, what's going on here is inside this project, I'm creating a brand new kind of a list. Right? It's going to be based off the contact list. Once I go through and create this list, I'm then going to, in my feature that created the list, he's then going to go through and create a new column on that list called like location tag, I think is what I used. Um, what that's then going to do is that's going to allow me to go through and have this new column that's going to be tied to the um, taxonomy, the, the term set that I just created in the last, in the last demo. Okay? Let's come back over here and we're going to walk through this. That was really quick. So here's my list. Contact list with automatic tags. All right? So let me just do one little tweak here to make it easier to see what's going on. We're going to customize the view. We're going to get rid of almost all of these fields. We don't care where you work, where, how to get in touch with you. No attachments. We want to find their city, their zip code, their state, and the location tag, the new one that we just created. We're going to stick location tag as last. 35. Okay and save our changes. Okay. The other thing that this demo did, that the code was doing, is I'm creating an event receiver. That's what we're going to spend most of our time in. Our event receiver, what he does, is he says, once you go through and you update this, uh, a new contact, you add a new contact, I want to go through and do an automatic tagging. Let's look at the city, the state, and the zip that you plugged in, and let me see if I can find them in the term set. And if I can find those things in the term set, I'm going to apply all the terms that I find to this location tag field. You might look at this and say, how is that really going to be useful? How is that going to help me? Well, if any of you have used some of the managed metadata stuff in the past, you've seen that there's a lot of ways that this is going to be, that metadata gets surfaced in SharePoint more than just a standard text field. One thing that's going to be really helpful is using the managed metadata navigation or the, the, nav the metadata-based navigation inside of a list. So we're going to turn that on, and what I'm going to be able to do is I can start drilling in and finding, show me everybody in Florida, and it's going to find all of the different neighborhoods and zip codes that people have been tagged with inside of Florida. Or I can narrow it down a little bit more. So a nice little UI kind of uh, thing that, that they gave us. Another thing that we're going to get from this is the benefits of the refinement panel in search. When I go through and do a search for people in that contact list, it's going to find all those people, but on the left-hand side, it's going to automatically pull out all of the terms for all the results that it found, and I can start filtering things, my search results down. 
here's all the people I found in your contact list. Narrow it down to Florida. And it'll start using those things. It, won't, it can't go through and surface those kinds of things from standard text fields in the refinement panels without creating custom refinement panels, which is a whole other session and, quite frankly, a lot more painful. So let's go through and create one or two items so you can see this guy in action. So create me, Andrew Connell, come down here, scroll down to city, state. I actually live in a place called St. John's, Florida. Let's actually stick a dot in there for demo. 32259, that's good enough. You don't need to hunt me down. I'll save this. Notice I'm not putting anything in the location tag. I'm going to save this, and what you'll see is that when this page, when the, the list refreshes, it's going to automatically populate the location tag with two tags, right? With two terms, Florida and our zip code. Let's go through and put some other, uh, some other goofball in here. Ted Patterson sounds like a pretty... Uh, Tampa, Florida, and I don't know what zip code it is. So we have two people listed, okay? So you can see how that's going through and that's working. We can go through and you can use, um, for those of you who haven't seen this, it's nice because I can come in and modify the list uh, settings and turn on the manage metadata navigation. So metadata navigation, come over here, location tag, location tag, okay. And down here on the left-hand side, when I look at my list, I can start opening things up and saying, find everybody in Florida. And it finds both of them. Find everybody in Jacksonville. Well, St. John's is seen as kind of like a, sub, a suburb of Jacksonville. What about Tampa? There's Tampa. So that's cool because it's flattening everything in the list. It doesn't care about folders. It's just going to show everything. So that's one of the cool UI things we're going to get out of this. Um, I, per, I, so we did this for one customer. And I personally thought this was like really trivial. And I've now done this multiple times for, for multiple customers. They look at this and they say, this is one of the most helpful things that they've seen in SharePoint. I'm like, really? It took like five minutes to build it. I sure should have sold that. Anyway. So there's an opportunity for somebody out there. Don't steal it, please. Um, I'm just kidding. All right, so how does this work? Now, what I did is that, um, let's first, let me first show you the part about creating the list. So I, there's nothing special about creating the list. I just create a standard list instance. Said this list instance is going to be based off of a content type. Why do I know 105 is a content type? Because I've been doing SharePoint for way too long. Um, come over here and look at the feature receiver that actually created the content type. And if we look at the code for this, that's where we'll see how to create. Let's get rid of that stuff at the bottom. What we'll see is in my activation event right here, what I'm doing is get a reference to the current site in the list. I'm going to go through and create my managed metadata field, and then um, I'm going to create the, the feature, the event receiver, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. So I come down here, creating the managed metadata field. You can see this is that priming stuff that I told you you're going to have to do on each one. You need to get a reference to the session. You have to get a reference to the term store, the actual metadata instance, the managed metadata service app instance get a reference to the group, and then get a reference to the term set in question. Once I've done that, I want to create my field. So I'm going to create my field, calling, going to the fields collection on that list. If I was doing this as a site column, I'd go through a similar process. And I'm going to say create a brand new field. I'm going to pass in the actual object type of that field and give it a name, and then follow it up with, OK, cast that as a taxonomy field. I'm going to, be, I'm going to want to use this specific taxonomy field because I have some things that I need to set. This is where I think it gets kind of funny. SSP ID, right? Anybody know what that is? Remember shared service providers? Oh, we got rid of those, right? We broke the glass on that thing. We broke up all the little pieces of a shared service provider, and we said, look, service apps, right? Which I like to think of more as service offerings. But hey, that, that right there, that ID, that is the ID of our managed metadata term store. So that's the instance. This is the kind of stuff that I say you don't normally have access to this stuff when, you, um, when you're doing this, if you try and do this stuff declaratively. So I'm going to set the ID of the, the service app. I'm going to set the ID of the term set itself in that service app. I'm going to set a couple of the properties saying, can it hold multiple values or not? Then I'm going to add it to the field collection and then save my changes. So not too bad. Um, what I find is that most people get tripped up on that right there. Priming it and then getting the IDs they need and then setting them on that field. That's the part that trips people up. 
Now I mentioned too that we have an event receiver that's going to fire every time somebody adds an item. Now I, the way I did this one in this demo, just in, because I'm going I'm to make the slides and the code available to you. Um, I'm not exactly sure if the conference site has a way to go through and distribute that, but I'll have all of this stuff up, a uh, link from my blog sometime in the next few days. If you just watch that, I'll have a place where you can get all my demos from this week. The, um, the, the thing that I wanted to do with this one is that I didn't want to add this event receiver to every single contact list. I wanted to add it to this specific one. And as most of us know, that you can't do that declaratively in a feature. You have to do that programmatically by manually adding the event receiver to that specific list. That's what this method, add to contact list event receiver, that's what he's doing down here at the very bottom, is he's creating a brand new event receiver here whenever things are added or updated and I'm just going through and passing in all the stuff that we need to go through and say, here's the event receiver, it's inside of this DLL, it's, this is the name of the class, here's the type of the event, go through and put it on that list, save your changes. Now we have two event receivers attached to that specific list. All right? Okay. Now, the next thing, the, the part where this gets really interesting is when we look at the actual event receiver. Now, before I get and start showing you some of the code with this, there's one thing that I'm doing in here that I know you're going to look at this and you're going to say, why in the world are you doing that? You don't need to do that at all. That's a waste of time. I know it is. It's going to be used when we talk about the link stuff in a few minutes. So I'm kind of using a dual purpose on this guy. What I'm going to do here is in the event receiver, I first am going to go through and I want to make sure because this, these are asynchronous things, I want to do this after an item has been added or after it's been updated, I want to turn all of the, the um, the events that are going to fire, I want to turn all the events off for just a minute. All right? I want to turn them off for just a minute. And the reason why is because I'm about to update the item again. If I update the item again and I don't do that, my event's going to get fired off again and then again and again and again and again and again. And that's not going to really go so well. Okay? So I'm going to then call into this method down here called update lo uh, location tags field. So the part that I said is kind of like, why in the world am I doing this? I've already got access to the list item. Um, there's this link stuff right in here. Just ignore that for right now and just know that, hey, I've got an item here. I've got, I still have a reference to the actual item in my list. I'm going to go do that same kind of priming stuff that I have to do here, get a reference to the taxonomy session, the store, the group, the term set. I'm going to create a new generic collection of terms. And what I'm going to do kind of for each of those different fields I want to check. I'm going to look at the city field right here, make sure that they put something in, if they did, I'm going to go find all of the terms that match that city, and I only want to show things that are available for tagging, or I only want to show things that are not deprecated. Right? I can't remember what that Boolean is. It's for one of those two. Which one was that? <coughs> Trim unavailable. So what it does is it's the la that last Boolean there that I'm using. Um, that's saying get rid of all the ones that have been where the uncheck has been where that check has been unchecked that say this is available for tagging. I don't want to use those because they're not available. I'm going to stick those into this list and I'm just going to do this for each one of those different fields, city, state, and zip, and just keep adding to this new collection that I've created. I'm then going to walk through that entire collection that I have and I'm going to do that weird kind of setting of the value here, right? So for those of you in the back. I'm going to get a reference to the actual location tags field that's on my list, and I'm going to say set field value, passing in the list item and passing in the, um, the actual uh, uh, collection of terms that I want to add to it. You can pass in a single item, or you can pass in a generic list or an innumerable list all right, of terms. And then I save my changes. Pretty straightforward, right? Not too bad? The only time you can run into trouble doing this is... Um, People will like to go through and they like to add lots of terms to columns uh, and lots of people forget to check that little box to say allow multiple values or to turn that one flag on when you're doing it programmatically and then stuff blows up. Well, yeah, you can't stick a lot of items into a bucket that has one spot. So, any questions about this before I go on to the link stuff? Yes, sir. Um, why did I, so the question was, why did I use the asynchronous event instead of the, the synchronous event? Yeah. Just because. Yeah, there's no specific reason. It would have worked either way. Okay. I was really tempted to have this big, long explanation right there, but no, it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, I guess the other reason is, too, is I didn't test it, so I don't know. 
I don't think there's a problem. I've never, I've, I've never had a need to kind of do it synchronously. I've always wanted to do this asynchronously because I don't want to hold up the user getting back to the list um, when I'm going back to the term set. I, so I have, I have one reason for this, but it was a really bad reason. Um, when I first did this, the customer that was doing this was insistent on using one managed metadata service app for their entire organization. That was fine, except it was a global organization, and they had farms all over the world. They had one managed metadata service app in Spain, and they wanted everything to kind of call back to that one farm in Spain. Managed metadata is one thing that you can syndicate or federate that service, and you can connect to it from other farms, but in a practice kind of way, really bad idea. Because you're, you're going to use those terms all over the different farms, it's going to be really chatty. You're across the WAN, a lot of latency. Not really a good idea. You want to come up with a way of going through and basically syndicating or, or duplicating the, the taxonomy in each one of the scenarios. In this case here, they were insistent on doing that. Well, when they go to do, when I'm doing these calls back to the service app, that could take time. So I said, hey, look, this has nothing to do with the actual item itself. It's just kind of adding, doing value add. So I'm just going to do this in the background. Okay, so the last thing I have is uh, getting out of full screen. Let me go back to the slides real quick. Let's go back to the slides quickly, and then I'll talk a little bit here about some of the link, uh, limitations here. Now, how many of you have worked with Link to SharePoint? All right, that's cool. Great new thing that we have, right? Fantastic. It's great. Well, my schema doesn't change, but it's great, right? There's a challenge to this. Like many things in SharePoint, there's a drawback to it, right? So how does this work? Well, let's first take a step back. Let's understand how it works before we understand what the challenge is. When you go through to build your model that you're going to use inside a link, that you have to provide to SharePoint so that it knows the schema of your data, when you go to generate this model, you're doing it using a tool called SP Metal. That's fine. SP Metal is going to generate the model, but he's only going to generate the model for fields that are based off of field types that you find in the out-of-the-box SharePoint Foundation install. So say that again, that you, you're only going to find <coughs> fields inside of your list items that you're generating the, the, the um, schema for. You're only going to find them of fields that are generated based off of your SharePoint Foundation data types, field types. What does that mean? That means anything from like publishing, you're not going to get that stuff. That means any custom field types that you create, those aren't going to show up either. That means managed metadata isn't going to show up either. Right? It's really tricky. You find people get really mad and they think that, oh, God, SP Metal is broken because I'm going through and generating this stuff, but my location tag would never show up. I'm like, oh, this is frustrating. So you're telling me now that I can't even go through and use metadata and link. No, not saying that. I'm saying out of the box you can't do it. All right? There's a way to go through and do this, though. All right? There's a way to go through and do this. Thankfully, what Microsoft did is they gave us a way to extend the model that they generate. First, they're very nice about the way that when they generate their model, they do it as a partial class. So it's going to be very easy for us to go through and extend it. There's this interface called iCustom Mapping. Right? There's this interface called iCustom Mapping. I'm going to be able to create a new class that has the same lineage, the same inheritance hierarchy as the one, I'm, as the one they generated. I'm going to throw on a new interface called iCustom Mapping that has three methods. The three methods, oh, is it, uh, do I have a list? I don't have a list there. The three methods, they basically work like this. It's when I get the data from the database, how do I put it in this list item? When I take the data from the list item, how do I pass it back to the database? And then if there's a conflict of when I'm going and getting data and it's different than what came in versus what's coming back out because of a concurrency kind of thing, what do I do? A conflict resolution method. So you have to write those three methods. The nice thing that I found is that um, I've basically written those methods once, and the only thing I have to do is go replace the name of the field that they're going to go through and work with. So you don't have to go through and to keep rewriting it. The, it's a little bit of plumbing that you kind of have to throw in there. there. There it is at the bottom. Map to, map from, and resolve. Those are the three things. So it's, um, those are the three things you have to add. Okay? So this isn't that bad. Let's go back. Let's take a look at this. So what I'm going to do over here is I've gone through, and in the project, I've got a little batch file that ran SP Metal, and when it ran it, I passed in this configuration file, and the configuration file said, hey, I'm only looking for my list that Andrew created with a really big name, and I want to exclude everything else from this. 
And what that did is that created this, is it this one? Yeah, this is the one that it created. So it creates this guy. And if I look deep enough in here, if I get to the very bottom, you'll see that here's the actual item that it created, my contact that's based off a contact item. And you see it's adding email, but really what it should be adding right after email is I really need that location tag in there. That right now, I'm not going to see that show up. If I come back over here to the one that I created, let's just do this really quick. And rebuild the project. And if I come back to my event receiver, and I look at this item that I just got here off this guy, and say contact item dot, I'm going to see all the fields for that contact list that I have, except for location's not there. My location tag field's not there. So how do I add it? What I'm going to do is I'm first going to go through and find the entire lineage of that object that they created. So if I come over here and take a look at um, this thing that I just commented, which we'll go through and uncomment this. It's based off of contact. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new, or I'm going to create a new class, which is well, not a new class. I'm going to create a partial class and extending the one they generated. He's got the same inheritance hierarchy. I'm going to implement I custom mapping, and what he's going to do is, if I look at first at the very bottom, he's got a new property called location tag, which spits out of type taxonomy field. So this is the actual tag. This is the property that I want to surface inside of my model, right? The last thing that I have here, you see where I'm, I'm calling in the on notify property changing? You want to make sure that you do that because inside of the link stuff, they have a way of being able to track things that change and getting, when data gets dirty. And so you can do a check to say which things do I need to go back and update back on SharePoint. If you don't do this, then it's not tracking any updates that happen to that one field for anywhere you're using this model. All right, so you definitely want to use the on notify property changing and changed just so you get the same kind of out of the box capabilities with link. The other thing is now I have these other three methods here. And like I said, these are things that I generally just go through and have to change out um, the implementation of that specific property. But in the map from field, getting a reference to the current list item and saying, well, the data that you're pulling back, I want to just go hand that back as a taxonomy field. So the location tag field, I'm going to go grab that, that column from my SP list item and I'm going to put that inside of that location field. This is what you're looking for. So I'm mapping my property to the actual column in that list item. I'm going to do the exact opposite inside of map two, and then I'm going to, um, in the resolve, this is where I'm just doing a quick little check for like any kind of conflict resolution. And you can see that most of that stuff is just kind of a copy-paste kind of change out when you, when you add new fields that you want to go through and, and extend. Okay? Take this guy, and then go build him. And if I come back over here to my event receiver, now when I say, bless you, contact item dot location, I now have my location tag, which you can see is of type taxonomy field. Now I can use it inside a link just like I would in anything else. All right? Yes, sir. No, so well, when you go through and you're going to do the list, it's going to, it's going to, I see, when you do the filter, I don't, the filter is not going to, the filter is going to get all the data back and it's going to do the filtering and link to objects. So it's not going to do it, it's not going to do it based on the camel value. Uh, it doesn't understand how to do, I'm pretty sure that's the case. Like not, I'm not totally certain of that now that I say that. I'm pretty certain that's the case though. I don't think it's, it, this one's not going to dynamically generate that because link doesn't understand how to do that with that field, how to go through and build the camel. You don't define that. It's doing all that for you. So it's going to get all the data back, and the filter will be done on link to objects. Not the best, right, for performance. But, yeah. All right. Does anybody else have any questions about this? Is there any link model? You can because the link to X, because it's all the content types are being create, recreated inside of each one of the songs. So the question was, can I use the same technique with like external content types? So let me kind of expand the question a little bit to answer it. Um, 
So first of all, it, it kind of boils down to can I use link to SQL on content types and not just, or can I use it on content types or external content types? The extent, external list, yeah. So this, so for the for the basis of uh, this extending bit of extending the actual items here, if you can do the if you can do what we just said, if you can extend, uh, if you can do it for external content types, you can definitely do this as well because it's generating the model and you can just go modify the model. Um, yeah, you can still do it, for, to the best of my knowledge, you can do it for external content types as well to go through and to build a model because the external, external content types is, um, it's the, the label they gave it, the name they gave that feature is really not what it is. It's more like syndicated, right? It's syndicated content types. The, and a, a content type that you create in the hub and you say publish it out to all these other site collections, it's not really publishing it. It's kind of this own like little timer that's saying, let's go make a copy over here. Let's mark them all read only so that next time I run this, I know exactly what they look like. So when I'm actually working with an external content type over here, oh wait, no, sorry, you said external or? I'm, I'm doing the same thing in my head. I think. I just mixed the, I just mixed external and, and enterprise. I, I meant BCS. You meant BCS. Which is, I think, external content types. BCS is external content types. I was just describing enterprise content types. That was an interesting point you, you discussed as well. <laughs> I'm glad I answered that question. I, I knew that was going to be your next question, so I decided to go there first. <laughs> uh, for external content types, I think you can. I'm not certain. I'm not certain. So, do you know, you, I, I, haven't, I, don't, I, haven't used, I don't use external content types a ton programmatically, so I'm not totally sure. Um, the person to ask would be either, would be Nick Swan. I'm sure he's got a, he's here, the Lightning Tools uh, guys. Um, he would definitely know that off the top of his head. So link, so this is a good question. So um, is there a bit of a performance hit? Now is a question, is a bit of a performance hit by extending it or just in general with link? General, general. Yeah, so question, um, is there, you're going to get a bit of a performance hit when you're doing uh, uh, link to SharePoint versus camel? You definitely are. Link to SharePoint, just like link to objects and link to XML or whatever, it's a level of abstraction. Um, because what's going to happen is, is that link to SharePoint is going to translate what you just wrote into Camel, going to go run the Camel query, pull it back, and rehydrate a whole object collection. Um, the benefit, though, and there's going to be performance hit. I haven't seen exact numbers of what it is. I think I've seen, I've seen, well, I've seen numbers anywhere from five to twenty-five percent. But that's. I mean that I shouldn't have even said that. That the, I don't know where it's a, you know, with the classic SharePoint answer. It depends, right? Sure. Um, the you're going to get a bit. Of, you're, the benefit you're going to get from using link to SQL. Sorry, from using link to SharePoint, is in your productivity and of your developers. It's going to be a lot easier, a lot faster to write the queries. It's going to be a lot easier to turn solutions around and get them out. There's trade-offs. That's that the advantages. The disadvantages are. The queries are going to be a little bit slower, or that that part is going to be a little bit slower because you have a level of abstraction. Um, I I personally love the argument when people kind of go on this whole thing. Oh, link to SharePoint is absolutely worthless because it's a level of abstraction. Like right, you're doing all this in C plus plus, right? You've, you you forgot about this thing called .NET that does all the management of memory for you. Oh yeah, but that's not the same thing, right? Okay. Um, the um, the other kind of downside that you have is the classic kind of debate that comes up with uh, link to SharePoint is. Well, what happens if I change the list? Then what happens? And then yet again, we say in SharePoint our favorite phrase, well, it depends. What did you change? What did you do? I added a column. Probably not going to make a difference at all. It's a required column. Yeah, OK, things are probably going to break. I updated a column. Well, what did you do? I don't know. Well, then it depends. I removed a column. Is it going to break? Well, it depends. Are you using that column in any of your queries and the link queries? No. Well, then you're probably fine. Well, I am using it. Well, then it's probably going to break. Oh, well, link to SharePoint stinks. This is terrible. No, it's not. I mean, it's the, it's, I remember when this first came out, it was a fun debate that we always had. I teach SharePoint development classes, and these two questions always came up, right? Um, there's like five questions in a class, and we have this little bingo game that we, the, the instructors in my place play, and they're all like, you know, who's going to be the first one to run through a class where these five questions don't come up, or one of them doesn't come up, and we've yet to do it in two years? Those are two of them, right? Um, what happens when I change my data, or I change my schema? Well. Let's think about the problem, right? You're changing the schema. So let's draw a little analogy here. What happens on your web application when you go change the schema of a table in SQL? I don't know. It depends, right? It depends on what you did. 
right? In SharePoint, if you change the schema that stuff is based off of, stuff could break because you're changing things that everything is, de is derived upon or is based on. The challenge that SharePoint brings into the, into the equation here is that in most applications, people don't have access to the schema, right? Like in SQL and everything, or excuse me, in most well-built applications and secure, they should not, the developer should not have direct access to the database. The user should not have direct access to the database, especially modifying the schema. In SharePoint, though, the UI is there to kind of promote and push, say, yes, you can go through and do this. You can tweak the schema as much as you like. Well, thankfully, SharePoint does give us some facilities around this to kind of protect things. So, like, if you're going to use Link to SharePoint, you, you really need to do some, like, defensive kind of techniques. So, do things like um, go modify the list permissions and say only certain people can make schema changes to this list. One of the ones that I do on mine is I'll go through and create an event receiver, attach it to that specific list. I trap the, I think it's the field add, adding, updating, field updating and field deleting events, basically just saying trap the synchronous event for any schema changes and check to see if they're a site collection administrator. And if they're the primary or secondary, let it go through. Otherwise, throw an exception and say, sorry, only these two guys can go through and make their changes to the list because they've been made aware that there's a lot of stuff that's based off of this one thing, right? So it's just a trade-off. It's yet another data access tool that's available to us. You don't have to use it. Camel is, is going to be faster than using Link to SharePoint, but I can knock a solution out faster than somebody who's writing it with Camel. I don't care if somebody says, oh, I'm really good with angle brackets. You know, go for it, bud. <laughs> I can still knock it out a lot faster. Yeah, but if you change the schema, I'll quit whining. Right. So, just another tool in your toolbox. Any other questions? A couple more minutes. No? Yes, sir. You almost got question number three in the class. <laughs> I was going to say, if you say rename, like, yes, got two, three, of, got three out of five. Um, so first, what happens if I change it? Let's say, let's do change first. If I change the term, if I, if I rename it, um, what's being stored in all of the different items and all the different lists is the ID of the term and the term itself, the default label. So if I change Florida to, let's say Mississippi, because nobody knows how to spell Mississippi outside of the people that live in Mississippi. Um, they run out of S's and P's for some reason. So they, let's say they put one S in there, right? Um, if I go through and I rename that term to be the correct one, then what happens in a background job, SharePoint's going to go through and it's going to update all the list items throughout the entire farm or throughout any site collection that's attached to that term set, uh, to that term store with those new values, right? So it knows the new values. The ID stays the same though. So if I do a search against that term, it's still going to find the misspelled one or the, or the correctly spelled one until everything gets synced up. In practice, it's a little bit better to um, add a label of the misspelled one so people who still don't understand how to spell Mississippi can still keep using the old one, but we're still using the new one, right? That's for the people. That's, those are for what, what do we call those? People that don't get stuff. Users. We, they, we just sit there and, right? We told you. We told you. Like, no, one, I don't know. Um, the, so what happens if I delete the term? So the data, I think the data still stays in the list that's been tagged, but I think it stays in, the data still stays in the list. But the thing is, is that in practice, you don't really want to delete the term. You really should be like deprecating it or pushing it down to the keywords and just saying, look, this is not a managed term anymore. You don't want to just say it's not there. Um, it's just not, with th everything is based off, it's just not a good idea to just say, I have terms that are out there. This is not something we should blow away. So in practice, you really shouldn't do it. So is there anything programmatically that can pick up if somebody has come? So that's, that's like my wish list. If I had a bunch of stuff that I could say, what do I want and, and um, what, would I, what would I want like share, in the next version of SharePoint? Um, that's part of the stuff that I would love to have in this. I mean, I'd love to have a way to just say, let me put events on my term sets. Let me put um, things out there that say that I can track people doing stuff. Let me put workflows around adding and removing terms, stuff like that. That stuff isn't in this right now. It's still... A, still a V1. Um, it's a very good V1, but it's still a V1. So that's the kind of stuff that you would expect to see. Today, we don't have that now. So you just want to make sure that the people who have the ability to do those things are responsible. Generally, it's going to be a librarian um, 
or your IA person that should know better, right, than just deleting terms willy-nilly. Okay. Does that answer your question? Okay. Okay, time for one more question. Okay, I have time for no more questions. <laughs> So um, thanks, everybody, for coming. I hope you got something out of this. If you have any other questions going forward, please feel free to uh, either track me down this week, come up after the session, or fire me a question on Twitter, and I'm more than happy to answer it. So all right, thanks a lot.